Uh, thank you, worship team. Uh, their song selection this morning uh, has already preached the message, and I hope what I add doesn't destroy it <laughs> or detract from it. Uh, our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Uh, my sins are many. His mercy is more. Uh, I want to thank our church family. Uh, yesterday at the uh, service for Scott Stevens, uh, the son of Chris and Jean, uh, we just had a wonderful uh, number of people from our church family who came and uh, shared their love to Chris and Jean and to the family. And I want to say thank you for that. Uh, it, was, it was exciting to have to add about 40 more chairs to what we had planned for. And it was wonderful for uh, so many in our church family who helped contribute and provide for a meal for the Stevens family and other guests that stayed. And uh, so and having an activity here on a Saturday means that people had to come in last night and early this morning to get things ready too. And so uh, I'm just so thankful for a church family that, that participated uh, so willingly and generously. And thanks for loving on that family. Uh, if you don't have a program close by, uh, find one off a chair near you, please, because there's some notes in there that I want you to uh, follow along with this morning. And if you don't have a pen or pencil with you, uh, look needy, and maybe a neighbor will share with you. But uh, don't make that an excuse that you can't write a few notes, okay? Uh, seriously, just, just let someone know, and uh, I know we have extra pens and pencils around, or we can share. That's okay too, right? To share a pen or pencil with a neighbor, so however that works. Uh, I hope you have been in Romans 5, and if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn there now. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the first books of the New Testament, Acts, and then the book of Romans, Romans chapter 5. Let me pray. Father, we invite you uh, to speak to us today. Your word is so precious. Father, it's your message to us. The words of life, the words of truth, the words of hope. And Father, over the, the centuries, your people, your church, been so faithful in copying your word and translating it and making it accessible to us today. But Father, your word is, is not just to be read and understood, but to the power of your spirit, might you transform us by your truth. So Father, uh, I pray that you would keep my tongue silent from things that uh, are not in your word and make my tongue clear for the things that are from you. Thank you. In Christ's name, amen. Well, we continue our, our study of the good news. God's good news found in Romans. And uh, today... I want to introduce to you the two most influential people in history. And uh, if you've read ahead in Romans chapter 5, our passage, uh, I think you probably have a pretty good idea of who those two people are, who those two men are. Uh, 
Last week, uh, Pastor Greg brought us into Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, and uh, he had the image of Graceland, <laughs> living in this new life of grace. And uh, uh, today, I want to continue off of that and extend off of that. And uh, so first of all, on your notes, you have two columns right there at the top. The two most influential men in history. On the left side, it's Adam. On the right side, it's Jesus. And today, during the sermon, during our passage as we look at it, we're going to look at Adam's actions and what they <laughs> contributed <laughs> to our world around us. And we're going to look at Jesus' actions and how what he did contributed even more. I hope you hear that a lot. I hope you experience that. We already sang about it. His mercy is more. I hope that's, that's where we want to land at the end. That even though the effects of Adam are so overwhelming, the effects of Jesus are even more. And that's what's in this passage. So you have the two columns, and we're going, I'm just going to read through, and I have the New International Version in front of me this morning. And uh, perhaps you've already done this in your workbooks if you just made some observations from the passage. But we're just going to list underneath the name of Adam, and then here a little later in the passage, underneath the name of Jesus, the things that, that relate, that correspond, that are, are come from those two men. So let's just get started here in verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, that's Adam. We already have something underneath the word Adam. It's sin. Because of Adam, sin entered the world. Underneath Adam, it's the word sin. Then it says this, and death through sin. So there's another word to add under Adam. Death. Adam, through his choice, brought sin and death to the world. We keep reading. And in this way, death came to all people. So now if you want to put that adjective by the word death, death comes to all. Death to all. Verse 13, for before the law was given, sin was in the world. When there is no law, when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as Adam did. If you want to write there that Adam broke a command. He broke a command. As did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. Verse 13. But the gift is not like the trespass. Here we come into a contrast between the man Adam and the man Jesus. And the first word that we have under Jesus in this column, there's a gift. There's a gift. Under Adam is the word trespass. He broke the rules. He crossed the line. God said no trespassing and he trespassed. Verse 13 if we continue. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man Adam, how much more did God's grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Grace under the sight of Jesus. Grace. Verse 16. Again, the gift of God. All right? There we already have that. The gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed 
One sin, Adam's sin. So what's on the left side under Adam? Judgment. Judgment. Judgment followed Adam's sin. And brought, here's another word, condemnation under Adam. Condemnation. Adam's choice led to judgment, led to condemnation, sin, death. It's a trespass. He broke the law. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought on the right-hand side under Jesus justification. Justification. I'm keeping up. We're getting through it. You feel like you're making progress? How many of you did this this past week in your observations? One, two, three, four, and a few others that are shy. It just seemed obvious. You start reading the passage and there's two men. And they're laid in parallel in some ways, but they're also contrasted very much here. All right, so where'd we leave off? Verse 17. For if by the trespass of Adam, one man, death reigned. You already got the word death. Maybe you want to go back up and care, uh, put this adjective next to it. It reigned. It ruled. Death reigned through that one man, Adam. How much more? There it is again, right? Our theme for today. How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace? You got the word grace already? Do you have the word grace there yet? I can't remember if we put it there. But that gift is grace. It's abundant, right? The abundant gift of grace. And the gift of righteousness. That goes underneath Jesus. The gift of righteousness. The gift of grace. The gift of righteousness. Instead of death reigning, the next phrase says that life reigns. Under Jesus, life reigns. We will reign in life. Life reigns under Jesus. Through the one man, Jesus Christ. Getting back to verse 18 to the end, 21. It summarizes it. Don't know if there's any more to add. Let's see. But here's a good summary of it, right? Here we go. Consequently, verse 18, just as the result of one trespass, Adam's, there was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life to all men. For just as through the disobedience of one man, Adam, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The two most influential people in history. We don't have to go far to see how Adam and his choice has influenced us. Influenced our heart. Influenced our world influence of corruption, right? Of destruction. Uh, we don't have to go far to see that. And yet, what Jesus has done is greater and more than all of that. So at the end of this, I think it was verse uh, 20 here, uh, 19. There's a couple more blanks to fill in there underneath these two columns. Maybe you've already done it. Under Adam, an act of disobedience brought death to all people.
that you know the right side through an act of obedience brought life. All people have access to life. Brought life to all people. I just want to... Uh, so the study of Romans... And these, this first several chapters, there's not, there's not these places that pop right out where there's a command for us to obey. All right, there's, there's nothing that we read there that tells us what to obey. And really, these first several chapters of Romans is revealing to us just what God says is true. And uh, instead of writing doctrine or theology there in your notes, I said, this is what God says. <laughs> right? It's what God says. It's what God says is true. And uh, people can, can analyze it and try to explain it and figure out and try to come up with things, but this is just what God says. Already in this passage, God says that there was somebody named Adam that lived on this earth. Okay? That should say a lot about creation. That should say a lot about Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. That Adam was a real person. The garden was real. The rules were real. God was real. Like... That, that's just right here assumed in this passage that God says, as Paul is writing this, that there was one man, his name was Adam, and he made a choice. Right? So what came first? Chicken or the egg? That's what came to my mind when I wrote that. Look at verse 19. We're going to start near the end of the passage and then circle back toward the front here in a moment. I don't know if you noticed this when uh, you're looking at it this week, but verse 19 says, For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. If we just stop there. God said... God has declared that Adam rebelled, disobeyed God, and all the children of Adam, all of humanity, because of Adam's choice, were all sinners. Okay? So, here's kind of where the distinction is. There's some who believe that we're born good. And that if we could have the right environment around us, that a human being would always make the right, the good, the moral choice. Adam, because he sinned, it's declared here by God that Adam's sin makes us sinners at birth. At conception. When we become a human being, we are born. We have a sin nature already. We're already rebels against God. We can't say that that person or that situation made me do it. We're born with a sinful nature. It's who we are. What came first? We're sinners first. And because we're sinners, we sin. Do you see the difference? We don't sin first and, oh, I guess now I'm a sinner. No, I'm a sinner first by nature. And so what comes natural? What comes natural to humanity? Sin. what we're all bent toward. Sin. Look at the news. Look at 
brokenness in families and in relationships. Look what's going on around our world. Wouldn't you really think by after all these experiences of war that humans would have at least figured out that there's no winners in war and probably we shouldn't do this? And yet what rages on endlessly? War. Right? Why? Why haven't we solved that? Because at the heart of humanity is sinfulness. It's in our nature. That's what comes first. Number two, death doesn't lie. Go back to uh, verses 12 through 14. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. You can read and write and look at this from both directions and it's the same. Why do we die? Because of sin. We all die because of sin. What does death tell us? We all sin. We all die because of sin and the existence of death tells us that we all sin because no one escapes death. Why? everyone sins. What's the result of sin? Death. So every funeral and every trip past a cemetery reminds us that Adam sinned. We all are sinners. We've all sinned. And the end for humanity on this earth is death. And no one escapes it. Because all have sinned. Right? Does that make sense here? Like, and so he just, he says this, and then if we keep reading here in verse 13, uh, for before the law was given, sin was in the world. Well, before Moses, there were thousands of years between Adam and Moses. And during that time, what does it say? Before the law was given, before Moses was given the Ten Commandments and any of the rest of the law, sin was in the world. Anybody know how we knew sin was in the world? What did all the people do between the life of Adam and the life of Moses? They died. Thank you, right? It's like they died even before the law. And so what in the world's the purpose of the law? Like, the law... Didn't have to show up and, oops, I guess now we're sinners. Oops, now we die. No. Since Adam sinned, death was present. Because all were sinners. And all sinned. Verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned. Like, this is just crazy, right? But no one escaped it. Death reigned from the time of, from the time of Adam up to the time of Moses. Even over those who did not sin by breaking a commandment as Adam did. Well, they found other creative ways to sin, right? You get to the flood account in the whole world, except for a few, handful, eight righteous people out of the, all the whole population of the world. They found creative ways to sin. To go down to verse. Uh, let's go down to verse 20. It says, The law was added so that the trespass, the sin, might increase. What did the law do for us? <laughs> it just gives us a, a little more of a accounting of our sin. A categorizing of our sin. And what do cities and states and countries do? They keep adding more and more and more loss. Why? Because we're sinners and we come up with new creative ways for injustices. Don't we? So we have to add a law to it. And now at least there's this accounting to a law. There's a standard there that's, that's 
that's visible, that's very tangible. That's what the law is. The law didn't help, didn't cause us to sin. The law just let us know, wow, we're really sinners. Wow, there's a lot of sin. Number three, there's only two kingdoms, or the word families there. As soon as I wrote that, I was thinking back to my biology days with taxonomy, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, all like we had it. This is kingdoms and families. Several times in the passage, it says that it uses the word reign or ruled. It's a king. It's a kingdom. King Adam. The kingdom of Adam. The descendants of Adam. Right? Or it's King Jesus. It's he rules and reigns. And his, his, the people in his kingdom. Or you could look at it as the descendants, the family. Those who are born of Adam. And then in John 3, it does a beautiful thing because it talks about us being born in Jesus, right? Being born again into a new family. Well, right here in this passage, it, it alludes to that, that there's only two kingdoms or two families. Why are we sinners? Because Adam sinned. We might want to say, that's not fair. Why did God set it up that Adam was our representative? I did not vote for Adam. Okay? But in God's perfect, glorious plan and purposes, He set it up that Adam was the representative of all of humanity. He was the leader of humanity. And we might say... It's not fair. Why, why do I have to, why do I suffer the consequences of Adam's choices? Well, you know what else is not fair? Why do we get the blessings of Jesus' choices? Right? That's unfair also. There's nothing fair about the cross. It's grace. It's amazing, right? And so we can say it's not fair that what Adam did. That Adam was our representative. It's not fair what Jesus did either. But he did it for all of us. It's Adam's fault that we sin. It's Jesus' fault that we can be righteous. Can you say that? I mean, I, right? What Adam did caused us to sin, let us, made us sinners. But what Jesus did can make all people righteous. So there's a battle between these two kingdoms, between these two families. And it's existed since the sin of Adam in the garden. And Greg already alluded to it in our prayer and in our songs today that it's a battle between darkness and light. And Satan has worked hard to thwart the plan of God. And uh, Greg may have said last week that we live in Graceland. Well, I want to say that we live on the island of grace, surrounded by an ocean of death and sin. We're on an island of grace, and there's a big ocean of death and sin all around us. And what is God asking His church to do? To shine bright. And to redeem and reclaim and restore and send the good news out there to rescue others from sin and death. Right? But while we're on this earth, we 
we are just surrounded by an ocean of sin and death. Uh, there's three guys who are going to help me because when you're a part of a small group that I'm a part of. So come on up, gentlemen. And uh, they're going to do an illustration up here that I hope adds <laughs> to what I've been trying to, trying to share with you today and not detract from it. Daniel, thank you. <laughs> uh, these are actors. We have not overly rehearsed this. If Daniel begins to uh, look very desperate, I think we have it under control. Ready, my friend? And we have one more friend coming out here in a moment. I think we lost Paul. <laughs> we need Paul. The illustration does not work without Paul. When you see Paul, you will know that Paul is a necessary part of this. Very much so. Come on, Paul. Where are you at? <laughs> we need Paul. He's here. We're an island of grace that's surrounded by an ocean of sin and death. Is my heart is filled with loneliness. My heart is filled with envy. My heart is filled with strife. My heart is filled with hatred. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I experience worry. I experience sinful anger. I experience neglect. I experience blindness. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light, but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. I am overwhelmed by cancer. I am overwhelmed by disappointment. I am overwhelmed by cruelty. I am overwhelmed by tyrants. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I am surrounded by idols. I am surrounded by despair. I am surrounded by gossip. I am surrounded by violence. And Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My heart is filled with disease. My heart is filled with arguing. My heart is filled with conceit. My heart is filled with injustice. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. I experience rage. I experience war. I experience materialism. I experience sin. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous by faith will live. I am surrounded by a rejection of God's truth. I am surrounded by misrepresentations of Jesus. I am surrounded by slander. I am surrounded by strife. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. I am overwhelmed by destruction. I am overwhelmed by floods. I am overwhelmed by snake bites. I am overwhelmed by persecution. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. 
My heart is filled with wasted time. My heart is filled with funerals. My heart is filled with destruction of the environment. My heart is filled with bitterness. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Thanks, guys. The weight of sin. Is there any question that Adam is pretty influential? It didn't take me long to make a list of 150 <laughs> descriptions, categories, effects of sin. It's all around us. And there's a lot of it. There's a lot of it. And so much of it we get used to. It just becomes normal to us. It's not normal to be bit by a dog or to have cancer. It's evil. It's part of sin. It's part of the fruit of Adam's choices, right? And there is a lot of death and sin and the effects of it. And we read early in the book of Romans that wicked people know God's truth, they hear God's truth, and they suppress it. Somehow, by God's mercy, some who keep suppressing God's truth finally come to a place where they cry out and say, I want that for myself. I need help because sin is so much. It's so overwhelming. It's so overwhelming in my own life and it's so overwhelming in the world around me. I can't bear to read another story of a shooting in Xenia. Another drug overdose. Mental illness. It's heavy, isn't it? It's around us. It's everywhere. There's an ocean of it. And it says that Satan rules this kingdom. And death reigns. But don't lose hope. Because one kingdom, back to your notes, Adam's kingdom is more. But Jesus' kingdom is much more. And three times in this passage, it says... That it's much more. Yes, death reigns. And yes, it's heavy. And yes, it's abundant. And yes, it's all around us. But three times in this passage, grace, life, hope, justification, redemption, all these words, they're much more. They're much more. Sin abounded. And we, have, we deserve a whole lot of wrath. Right? But through Jesus, we have superabounding grace. More upon more upon more. Overflowing grace. If you looked at this passage this week, maybe you found some of those words. More, much more, overflowing, abundant for all men. Our sin is great. But grace is greater still. I just wrote down some ways, and maybe this is a time to flip over your notes, and maybe a couple of these you want to make note of. And if you, if you miss them, uh, listen to it online or ask me, and I can give them to you afterwards. 
But in some ways, here, here's some ways that I'm thinking that maybe we can understand a little bit why grace is greater than our sin. Uh, light pushes out darkness. Do you know that darkness is nothing? When God said, let there be light, he created something. You can't make darkness, but you can bring in light. And it's a picture of God's kingdom advancing, and we're on the offensive, and the darkness is there, and God has called us to take light into it to advance against darkness. Do you get that? Like the world is broken and suffering, and how are you participating with God to bring His grace and His life to the suffering world? And it's a lot out there, isn't it? It's a lot. Tell you this, death is temporary. It might be ruling now, but it says in Revelation that in the new heaven and new earth, death will be no more. And before Adam sinned, there was no death. So right here in this very small slice of history, death reigns. But for all eternity, death won't even exist. Right? Life is greater. Life is greater. And through Jesus, death is overcome. God is greater than Satan. We've got to remind ourselves of that. Listen to me. Satan was a created being. Satan exists under God's judgment. And someday Satan will be vanquished, right? What does God tell us? That when we come to believe in Jesus and accept the life into our heart, and he tells us, that God lives in us. That's crazy. The Spirit of God is in us. Nothing can challenge that. And I know it's dark out there. And I know there's a lot of sin. And it seems like we're battling uphill. But Jesus is in us. And Jesus can give us the strength to have victory. Step by step against the ocean death and disease and darkness and sin, right? Because God is in us, the all-powerful, the eternal one. Here's another way it's greater. When Adam sinned, God didn't simply forgive him and give him another chance. In a sense, Adam was righteous before he sinned. He had never sinned. But he had a choice to sin. And if God just would have hit the rewind tape, well, Adam would still be in that same state where he could sin again. How is it greater? All of us who have put our faith in Jesus are on a journey to a place where we will never, ever, ever again have the desire, the ability to sin. Because God's righteousness is in us, right? And because of that, we have God's righteousness. It's a righteousness of the eternal God who does not change. And we're on a journey. Our destination is a place where we won't want to sin. We won't be able to choose to sin. It's much better than Adam's sinless life before he sinned. Do you get that? We're sinners of Adam? Well, the Bible tells us that those that are in Christ Jesus were a new creation. God gives us a new nature. We don't, we are no longer ruled. We no longer have to follow our sinful nature. We now can live in the Spirit. We now can do 
things that are good and that bring glory to God. It's greater. The old nature will ultimately be crucified, will be gone, and all that will be left is new nature. And it seems right now that we can't ever escape this old nature, right? But the reality is, it's as good as dead. All our sin, by God's grace, has been paid for. Past, present, and future. This hit me this week when I was looking at this and thinking it through. When Van steps across the threshold into eternity, in one respect, I'm still going to be a sinner, a sinful person. Because I live in this world and I sin. But what will be true? Because I've put my faith my belief, my trust in Jesus. God doesn't see me. He sees Christ's righteousness. It's never going to be up to me to be good enough to get to heaven. Sometimes we think or we know that when we accept salvation. I can't get the weight off my chest. God, save me. But then we live as if Oh, we're never going to be good enough. We're never going to be good enough. That's correct. But Jesus is good enough. And God sees Jesus' righteousness on us, in us. And he says, come on into this new life. Into this new relationship. For all eternity. Where there is no death. What's the one thing today? Is it true? That Adam's been pretty influential in history. God, help us to realize that Jesus is more influential. There's victory. There's hope. There's a lot of battles on this earth. But we know who wins the war ultimately. There's a hymn that uh, some of you may be familiar with. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and guilt. Yonder in Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Sin and despair, like the sea waves cold, threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe, all who are longing to see His face. Will you this moment his grace receive. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Worship team, come on up, please. I want you to think. Are you a child of Adam, a sinner, never cried out for help, crushed by the weight of sin. For God so loved the world that He gave His Son that whoever believes in Him will have life. The weight of sin will be lifted off. 
and a new relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're living under the overwhelming weight of sin and guilt, and the Holy Spirit is making that clear to you, cry out to God. During this song, grab someone next to you and say, help me. Being crushed by sin. There's another way to respond, and that's in our Christian walk, we still at times get crushed by sin, don't we? Maybe we need to grab someone here and say, pray for me. Or maybe this is the moment where you're being crushed by your own choices of sin. And at your seat, instead of standing, you'll bow your head and say, God, forgive me. Or maybe it's moving to the front up here and kneeling and saying, God, forgive me. Would you stand? And I want to invite you you to do some action. I'm not really super comfortable with it. But an action. Maybe it's to sit down in a moment and pray. Maybe it's to kneel at your seat. Maybe it's to come up here. Maybe it's an action of putting your hands out and saying, God, I need your grace. I need to see your grace, your infinite grace, because life is hard. And the world is dark. And I'm only hanging on by a thread, but God, give me grace. Maybe you hold your hand out. Or maybe this is the moment, it's a little stretch for us Baptists, but maybe this is the moment for you to surrender. And say, I belong to Jesus, this kingdom. And I surrender to Jesus. I don't know what action you want to take, but I'll invite you to take some action. And if a neighbor reaches out and says, would you pray for me, would you just... I know you will. God help us. Thank you.